Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about a bit of a grab bag of topics centered around really linguistic relativity. Is that our main topic? I guess so. Also, we're going to be talking months and months and months after everybody else talked about it, about the movie Arrival. So, welcome to, I guess, season three of The Endless Knot. Is it three already? Wow. Yeah, it is. Not exactly the right time to start a new season, I think, since our first season started in June, I think. But arbitrarily, since to me, New Year is September. It always has been and it always will be. <laughs> um, I think it, it makes most sense to restart the season in as much as we have seasons, which we don't, this September. So as our first podcast in September 2017, I've decreed arbitrarily that this is the beginning of season three of the Endless Knot podcast. Welcome. <laughs> and so, as I said, to start off, we're going to be talking about the movie Arrival and a few other things. But before we get to that, a little bit of housekeeping to do. One of the things I wanted to say, since we are starting a new season, is this is a good time to ask if there's any topics or particular subjects that you'd like to hear us talk about, or any people that you'd like to hear us interview or talk to, please send us some suggestions. It's not that we're running out of things to babble on about. <laughs> we, we haven't jumped the shark quite yet. Well, at least we don't think we have. <laughs> That's really never up to the person producing it, is it? To make that determination. But it occurred to me that we've had some good suggestions in the past from listeners and anything that anyone would like us to talk about, let us know on Twitter or in the comments and we'll see if it sparks an idea for us. Next, I wanted to say thank you to a batch of new Patreon supporters because we've had a fair amount of new support in this last little while. We wanted to say thank you very much to everybody who's been able to pledge us some support. And in particular, we wanted to thank Alec Morrison, Jesper Rosenkild, and Chirag Mehta, all three of whom have recently pledged on Patreon. And we just wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you very much. Because of your donations and those from some other people, we've recently passed our highest goal that we had so far set up for ourselves, the level, which is amazing. We're now trying to think about what we want to do in terms of setting new goals and what we can do to make this podcast and the videos better and how they can be worked better into our lives, which are always a little too full. <laughs> and as part of that, we also want to think about maybe changing or adding to some of the levels for the supporters that we have and the rewards that we currently have set up on Patreon. So that's another thing we'd really like to hear from people about. If you have any ideas of things you'd like to see as rewards, things that we could give or do for people, we'd love to hear about that. So any suggestions that you have, pass them on to us here at Patreon, on Twitter, on Facebook, wherever you can want to reach us. And finally, just a little reminder that this podcast is part of the Humanities Podcasts Network. And you can find more podcasts on many subjects, including some people who we've had interviewed here under the hashtag Humanities Podcasts. And that's a great place to find out more about language and history and art and philosophy and myth and all sorts of things. So before we get to our main discussion, we do have cocktails. <laughs> cocktails. <laughs> okay, that made it sound wrong. Um, no, they're cocktails. They're definitely <laughs> mixed spirits drinks. There's no doubt about that. The reason Mark is laughing at me is because we tried and tried and tried to find something that was thematically appropriate to this conversation. We even found a page of linguistics cocktails. <laughs> but they were more conceptual, conceptual yeah. <laughs> and sarcastic yes. than they were actually drinks you could make. Plus, none of them were about the right kind of linguistics. Hmm. So that just wasn't going to work. <laughs> So what I ended up doing was a sort of experiment, and I'm going to call the cocktail the Arrival Cocktail, which may be a horrible disservice to the movie. <laughs> and what I did was I attempted to make a cocktail that would replicate the famous images from the movie, those black circles in the gray kind of cloudiness. To do that, I, shall we say, infused some vodka? With gray? With gray, with black uh, using what we had in the house, which was some 
Hawaiian black salt, which made a sort of gray vodka. Uh, it was incredibly, incredibly salty. <laughs> <laughs> and then I tried some vodka with some black sugar that was from a Halloween cake decorating in the past. That made a deep purple <laughs> and just a slightly sweet vodka, which was okay. So then I thought, well, to heck with it. This is clearly not really working, but I'll just do something with it. I've got vodka. I don't want to throw that out. So I mixed both those vodka, vodka infusions, shall we call them, together, along with some more vodka and some triple sec and some lime juice. And I put them into glasses that had been rimmed with the black sugar. And if you go to alliterative.net slash podcasts, <laughs> you can see the pictures of this. I've just taken a number of pictures, some of them more artsy than others. I'm not quite sure which one I'm going to put up yet. <laughs> so we'll see. With the attempt to make a black circle with a gray background. They look all right. Yeah, they do look all right. They're not bad from a conceptual point of view. Now we have to try tasting them. <laughs> now, what's throwing us off here is, I mean, vodka and triple sec and lime is not a problem. Sugar rim is not a problem. The thing we're both terrified by is the salt. The salt. How salty is it? <laughs> How salty yeah. it is. So, we're going to try it. That's fine. It's not overly salty. No. Well, now that's making, when you drink the sugar, mm -hmm. it makes cloudy, sort of inky. Oh, yeah. I should have just sprinkled some of the sugar into the, into the drink. Mm -hmm. drink to make it a bit cloudy. Oh, yeah, look at that. All right. That's my new plan next time. Because I did think about squid ink, but it was hard to find squid ink at a moment's notice in yeah. Sudbury, turns out. <laughs> and it's perfectly drinkable. Yeah. Okay, that's reassuring because I was sort of terrified of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why don't we get to the movie itself then? So, as, as we mentioned earlier, the film we're talking about today is Arrival, released in 2016, directed by Denis Villeneuve. The screenplay is by Eric Heisserer, based on a short story published in 1998 called Story of Your Life by Ted Chang. And the film stars Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, and Forrest Whitaker. Now, we should say there will definitely be spoilers. Yes. And it's certainly the sort of movie that you don't, well, it's better to watch without knowing the twist. Absolutely. I mean, everybody probably has heard some of the basics of what the story plot is about, but there's a sort of major twist that we will talk about, I think. And of course, the reason that we're doing this now is that it recently uh, became available on Netflix. So if you haven't seen it and you do have Netflix, now is your chance to watch it. Mm -hmm. That's why we didn't see it and talk about it when all the other cool linguistic podcasts were talking about it, <laughs> because we didn't have a chance to go out to the theater without the kids. Yeah. Is my mouth as black as your mouth is turning? <laughs> I don't know, but probably. <laughs> It is, sugar is kind of <laughs> it is Halloween sugar. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to get into a in depth review of the movie because many people have done so, and there have been very extensive podcast discussions of it. By uh, I think Lexicon Valley talked about it, and I think Talk the Talk may have talked about it. I don't know because I haven't listened to them yet because I was waiting to see the movie before I listened to them. Lingthusiasm. Lingthusiasm definitely reviewed it. And probably the if you if you haven't seen it yet, the top thing on your list, if you're interested in this film, is to watch the Ling Space video on it. Right. Uh, they interviewed the McGill University linguists who were consulted on the film. That's it's, right. It's a really, really cool interview. Right. So there's lots of resources for you to go to to learn more about the movie, to learn more about linguistics in the movie. So we'll do a very sort of capsule discussion of our reactions to it. And then I think we want to kind of get into some of the questions it raises and some of the topics that are of interest to it. Mm -hmm. So first of all, what did you think of the movie? I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it sort of pushes all the buttons for me, you know, <laughs> a linguist is the hero yep. and it's science fiction in particular, a kind of time-based science fiction, mm -hmm. time travel-ish. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, these are all the sorts of things that I'm interested in and conceptions of time and, yep. and conceptualization of time. And so, I mean, this is, these are all Right in your wheelhouse, are, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I I thought it was a really, really good movie. I thought it was really well done and extremely sort of affecting. And we, the other thing about it is it's very unusual in its filming technique and style mm -hmm. for a big kind of 
I won't say blockbuster, it wasn't a blockbuster movie, but for the sort of wide release major movie that it was, you know, about an alien invasion mm -hmm. with the military and all the rest of it, it took very different kind of uh, approaches to pacing and soundtrack and filming and cinematography than we're kind of used to from like an action movie. Right. And I thought that was very effective. I was knocked a bit for a loop by it. Right. Because the non-alien plot part of it involves the death of a child. And I'm really, I find that really hard to cope with. And I had no idea that that was mm -hmm. like, everybody's kept that. I, I mean, I warned you there were spoilers. That's a major spoiler. Though, in some ways, it's not that major a spoiler because it's in the first five minutes. Yes. Like the first five yeah. minutes of the movie, mm -hmm. we see her with a child who was born, grows up and dies at, you know, as a teenager, yeah. basically. Of a disease. The significance of it doesn't become clear until the end. Yeah, but, and that's um, important for various plus, plot twist reasons, which we don't necessarily need to get mm -hmm. into. But that scene, those scenes occur right at the beginning, and then they're shown again and again and again. Mm -hmm. In particular, the, the deathbed scenes mm -hmm. recur at key moments as memories. So it just kept hitting me over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I found that really hard to cope with. So that's kind of colored my view of the movie. I found it incredibly sad. Now it's it's an up that sort of uplifting sadness where this message at the end is sort of a message of hope and love in the face of sadness and things. So it was not grim. Right. It was not a movie of sort of bleak despair by any means. But I found it really hard to handle, and I just didn't. It hadn't even occurred to me that there was going to be anything like emotional that I was going to have to cope with. Right. I thought it was going to be an intellectual and interesting alien movie. Right. So I really wasn't prepared for that. But that's not that's not a criticism of it. It's a very good movie, and it, you know it's really well done. It's just a kind of a particularly emotional button for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of effect of having the Amy Adams character, she, she's so detached all the way through. She's so isolated, yeah, all the way through the movie. And stuff is done with focalization of sound, so that you're hearing everything at a sort of as if there's a, a muffling barrier between her and the rest of the world all the time the way it sort of focuses the perspective of the camera from her perspective on mm -hmm, everybody else. Mm -hmm. Every Even in the middle of all these crowds, it was always this sort of disorienting division between her and everybody else mm -hmm. that I thought was really, you know, thematically important and mm -hmm. really well conveyed. Um, there was some amazing sort of soundtrack stuff in terms of music and sound, use of very odd musical mm -hmm. notes and mm -hmm. whether you call it music or sound that I just, I found really, really interesting. And such a slow pace to the film and the shots. Right. Even though there was this urgency about the storyline, you know, the storyline is compressed and everything has to be done really mm -hmm. fast. And everybody's working under incredible time pressure that the world is going to end if they don't fix this. And yet at the same time, there's this amazing sort of languorous mm -hmm. slowness to the way it was shot and, so I thought that was all really interesting mm -hmm. and really good. So that's my not very short summary <laughs> of my reactions to it. So do you want to talk about what is linguistic or what the language part of it? Well, I mean, the, there are two things here, two kind of related things. One is just that the depiction of what it's like to do this kind of field work where you have, where, where you're trying to figure out a language that you don't, you, you have no common language and, and you're you have no reference doing, points. Yeah. No reference points. The sort of monolingual, monolingual environment. Mm -hmm. How does a, a field researcher, a field researcher linguist accomplish this task? Mm -hmm. This is not a unique thing to the movie. This is a real thing that linguists have to deal with. Who are trying to put together a knowledge of a, a new language, and it's a difficult process. Mm -hmm. But there are you know procedures that how you know how you progress and build up knowledge of uh, you know the language and and mm -hmm. so it's it's a reasonably you know from what I understand this is not a field of linguistics that I work in, but from from what I understand of of, of the field, it's a reasonably uh, accurate yeah it's a portrayal sort of, of the the procedure mm -hmm. i mean it's it's uh, kind of telescoped yeah, I was it would say, not happen in any way near abbreviated yeah. rather it it would not happen in nearly that short a period of time so we're, we take, we're told that at one point we're told they've been working on it for a month 
Yeah, for instance, and a we've month seen is not very no, long, no, but <laughs> but but I mean, we've only at that point mm-hmm. we've only seen you know a few scenes of them together. Yes, and yeah. then we're told it's been a month, and they think it's going to be another month, and it's not absolutely made incredibly clear how much longer it is after that first yes. when they say yeah. it's going to mm-hmm. take at least another month for whatever. But yes, abbreviated. And while you say it's not a unique situation, it certainly isn't completely unique. But of course, the idea that is being posited is that they no not only don't have any language in common. But they have no frame of reference. Well, that's and that's the thing. And and that's one of the questions that I had mm-hmm. is that so sort of two things here. But usually when you do that kind mm-hmm. of research, mm-hmm. you've got context, mm-hmm. right? An environment. An environment. Mm-hmm. So you can pick up a rock and this is a common thing for, or a stick mm-hmm. or something. This is a common concept for both parties, one assumes. Mm-hmm. So you can, you have at least somewhere to start. Mm-hmm. You can point to the sky and you both see the sky. Now you might be saying blue, you might, you might be, be saying, saying but you, you know, you can, you can do that yeah. with the sky and then you can do so it with the water. So there's some trial and, and, and error there. Yeah. You can figure it out. But, yeah. but you've got a lot of, of environmental cues to, work, cues with, yeah. to work with. In this case, of course, they have almost none. Mm-hmm. They have each other's physicality. Yeah. Which they at least have. I mean, yes, at least I they're... certainly know there are science fiction stories that posit where you don't even get yeah, that, where, where you, you don't even see the non-physical other. Non-physical, en- either or, you don't see them or they're non-physical entities or whatever. Yeah, and then, and, or you don't know whether they are or not yeah. because you are trying to communicate. I mean, the idea of like SETI, for instance, right now, right. if yeah. we're trying to communicate with, were we to get information mm-hmm. from a, a an interstellar species, mm-hmm. you know, through radio waves, we'd have literally no way of knowing mm-hmm. anything about the originating species. And at least with um, other human languages, you know, you share the same embodiment. Mm -hmm. You have the same physical characteristics. characteristics. You have the same physical perceptions of the world. You touch things, you smell things. And you you can also make the same sounds. You see things, you make the same sounds. And the same gestures. Even if you may not make the same sounds, you have the same capability Capability of making those sounds sounds. and gestures. Mm -hmm. And you know that you you physically experience existence. You've both eaten. You've both. both, Yes. You share the same biological. How to defecate, you yeah. know? <laughs> so there's a lot of embodiment mm-hmm. in common there that can f- provide that frame of reference. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you you can't assume those things with the aliens. You you can see that they at least in this case that they are physical beings, mm-hmm. but they don't even experience gravity exactly the they same don't way. Gravity, you don't because know in this in this touch or mm-hmm. uh, you know, I mean, there's you don't see clearly that they have eyes, so no. you don't even know initially that they can see. Though mm-hmm. it becomes, I think, clear that they do see. You can make certain. There's certain judgments you can make. I mean, they put lights on. Yeah, creatures that can't see wouldn't mm-hmm. use visible spectrum light. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, there's they wouldn't have clear glass. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think there are a number of assumptions you can make yeah. pretty yeah. Yeah. concretely. Early on, mm-hmm. they must have some sort of respiratory feature because they seem to have a different atmosphere, you know, yeah, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, the number of, of things that you can be sure about or that you have in common mm-hmm. run out pretty fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that makes the job, you know, realistically, that mm-hmm. would make the job that much harder yeah. and therefore that much longer. And they seem to have gotten to very abstract level of vocabulary by the by the end quite, of- Quite, yeah. yeah quite, in, in, quite quickly. Quite quickly, yeah. But this idea of embodiment actually is, I think, a significant thing beyond just the the sort of practicality mm-hmm. of the process. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the things that I've speculated about in terms of this whole question of language universals, for instance, is to what degree is the similarities between language simply a result of the fact that we are embodied the same? Yeah. You know, we yeah. experience the world biologically the mm-hmm. same in pretty much the same way because of the way we're made as as beings. So does that inevitably lead to linguistic similarities? Mm-hmm. And this Do is we wh- have to posit that there's, uh, or do we necessarily have to posit that there's a language unit in the brain that... Right. Well, then... Uh, to a certain extent, it becomes a bit of a circular question. It is. Yeah. Especially because, if, especially if, as my understanding is, the Chomskyans have, um, please write in and tell me how horribly I'm butchering the theories, but that the Chomskyans have now extended the idea of a language universal or genetic component of it to a sort of whatever it is that makes us genetically able to do language is the thing that is the language center of the brain. You could say, well, physical embodiment is in the human form. Yeah, is the language that is, is the, the is the is the yeah. language yeah. capability right? That is the key. Mm-hmm. 
So you could even use what you just said as being like, well, there it is. That's the thing that makes us. It was when we became embodied in this form yeah. as opposed to the chimpanzee form that switched something mm -hmm. on. But I don't think that's exactly the same as what Chomsky is positing in terms no, of what, I think, what is a language universal. Yeah, I think it's something more specific, but, you know. Mm -hmm. Is is the fact that languages have basic, basic similarities a product of them all essentially coming from the same way our brains are wired? Or is it that is it whatever more, we do when we produce language, yeah. we're always going to sort of settle on the same kinds of things because... The similar experiences. Experience of the world. Yeah, yeah. and the similar embodiment. Mm -hmm. Certainly the cognitivists, I think, put a, a great deal of importance on the idea of embodiment mm -hmm. and how that affects language. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, it seems to me that there are so many other reasons or so many other possible explanations for mm -hmm. the similarities in languages that... It's, in you my mind, not a not a done deal that it has to come down to a language module. Right. There are a lot of other ways of explaining it, mm -hmm. and so I'm I'm kind of agnostic on that question about language yeah. universals. It it feels like most of the theories that are out there right now are not susceptible of proof yeah. at the moment. Yeah. They may become so, but at yeah. the moment they are not susceptible of proof. And more importantly, they are not susceptible of disproving. Yes, like, I know. They they can't be disproven. That's the big problem with the Chomsky argument. But is... it's also true of many of the other theories. Yes. Because they're so partial or, mm -hmm. or you know, that they aren't at the moment experimentally disprovable. Mm -hmm. And they're so complex that how it's like many things mm -hmm. to do with people. We have so many factors. Mm -hmm. And you can't do the control tests. Yeah, yeah. You can't lock children in a room and yeah, never teach yeah. them language. <laughs> you know, you can't do the, the things that you'd need to. And we simply don't understand enough about the way the brain works in, yeah. in general and not, not just in terms of language, but mm -hmm. in terms of anything else mm -hmm. that the brain does, uh, that it's, it's hard to, to work from mm -hmm. that standpoint either. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, so I agree. I mean, certainly I'm also just not well enough informed to take a yeah. stance on it, yeah. but I too sort of feel like anyone who feels like anyone who advances a theory that they think explains it right now, I'm skeptical of. Yeah. Yeah. What this movie is positing then is that the languages are very different in many, many ways, but it at bottom is sort of still assuming that you are trying to convey similar kinds of, you know, when they come down to getting their vocabulary items while the movie is talking about how the sort of sentences or words are framed very differently with this timelessness and all the rest of it. They still seem to be trying to convey the same basic notions. They seem to have equivalencies of vocabulary, which is not a given. No, though, on the other hand, we're seeing it from one side's yeah. perspective. So what are they missing? They may still be missing a lot. You mm -hmm. know, they may be approximating. Yeah. But, you know, they, she's... they. She seems to assume mm -hmm. that they can work towards a, an ascent. You know, she's of course not saying there's only a one to one correspondence between yeah. vocabulary yeah. items, and she argues strongly about that when people want to take it one yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and that is, you know, that sort of a side note of the frustration of the expert with the non experts yes. right. who want to seize on the simple answer. Right. Oh, you've told me that this word means this, and this word means this, and this word means this. So this sentence must mean this, and that's what it must mean. And you know, at the end, you even get the problem of a military guy is just like, no, what those words only mean those things. So that must mean this one. Mm -hmm. There's only one interpretation of those words. Right. And so you see that sort of frustration of the specialist who knows that everything is more complicated than that. Yeah. And then the non-specialist who just wants to say, no, give me the simple, straightforward answer. I think translators in general. I've always had to yeah, yeah. fight that particular problem. Everybody wants them to just, well, just tell me what this word means. <laughs> it doesn't just mean a word. I mean, I think anybody who's ever tried to work in more than one language knows that frustration, Yeah, at least on some level. But she still so seems to sort of feel that she can work towards, we're both going to have nouns and verbs, and even if they're not exactly nouns and they're not exactly verbs, they're going to kind of do those sorts of things. Though her explanation of why it's so complicated to figure out how to translate the sentence, what is your purpose on earth? Yeah. Was was good. It was good. Yeah. 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 I thought, you know, trying to undercut those assumptions that everybody's, you know, that's just an obvious thing. You just have to translate each of those words and then you'll know mm -hmm. what it means. And that's not that easy. Now, of course, the other central linguistic issue 
of the film is the infamous mm -hmm. Sapir Whorf hypothesis. Mm -hmm. To give a little background about this, this is the an idea that was it really came down to Whorf. Sapir had sort of touched on it vaguely, though he never clearly expressed a very deterministic idea. But it's Worf who expressed the idea that your language determines the way you are able to think. Right. Puts constraints Puts on your constraints thinking. Puts constraints on your thinking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's Worf, W-H-O-R-F, and it's not a Klingon. Yes. <laughs> Took me a long time to be completely certain in my mind that, that we weren't thinking about Klingons. <laughs> Edward Sapir is the his was his teacher, right? And then Worf, and then Worf took sort of the the sort of basics of the idea from Sapir and ran with it. And mm -hmm. now this was all happening in sort of the mid twentieth century or so. And since then, a number of the claims that Worf made as evidence to support this notion, mm -hmm. specifically. Which was at least in theory, field field work. work. Yeah. yeah. So he done. was basing this on research he did on the Hopi language, mm -hmm. a North American language. Interestingly enough, about Hopi conceptions of time. Yeah, I think that's not unco. I don't think that's coincidental. No. In yeah. Yeah. In terms of how this movie is focusing on conceptions of time yeah. as well. Yeah. A, a lot of that evidence has been kind of debunked. He was wrong about the evidence. Yeah, like the actual data. The data. Not just the interpretation, but yeah. the actual data he was collecting. Yeah, yeah. he didn't, he, his understanding of Hopi was... Poor. Poor. And so for a long time, especially as, you know, the, the sort of Chomsky school moved in, a lot of these... That's Noam Chomsky, also not a gnome. Yes. So go on. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized we're dropping a lot of names, names here that are familiar to names. us, but that we are not yeah. um, explaining. Uh, linguistic relativity or linguistic determinism mm -hmm. became a uh, kind of a fringe thing at best. Mm -hmm. It was basically best. completely... Not a lot of people were working on it and a lot of people, you know, kind of rejected the idea. Yeah, it became discredited, discredited. in mainstream linguistics, yeah. yeah. But I would say in the past 15, little maybe more than 15, maybe up to 20 years, there's been a renewed interest in the- What people sometimes call soft superior wharf. Yeah, or linguist. So sometimes the distinction is made linguistic determinism was the, the wharf's kind of- Strong Strong hypothesis. hypothesis. And a sort of weaker form of this linguistic relativity mm -hmm. is the soft- form of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And this posits that while not placing absolute constraints on how you can think, the language you speak affects the yeah. way you think. Yeah. And there been, there's been, in, in the past 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. more research done on this, more based on, a lot of it more has been more based on laboratory experiment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got actual right. subjects that you can test and do quantitative tests, you know, figuring out uh, reaction times, reaction times and, and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Emotional reactions and things. Now, some of that experimental work has also had trouble being replicated. I understand some of like, you're thinking of Lara Bar Borditsky's work in yes. particular. And I, I've heard a little bit that there's been some people who've had trouble replicating some of the experiments with, you know, green and things like that, the colors, you know. Yes. And then other pe others, people have said, yes, those experimental results are, are valid, but they're not very strong. They Boroditsky's work is mm -hmm. seems to be pretty solid. Mm -hmm. I think her, her results have, have survived. Are accepted kind of as results, but it's the interpretation. But that, the interpretation, you know, people say, yes, okay, it's true, but the effects are sort of minor. So small that should um, we say that it even matters, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And some of the more statistical tests, like the, the again, the infamous work of Keith Chen, who advanced the notion that languages that have strong uh, future time reference discount the future in terms of future-oriented behavior like savings. Mm -hmm. You know, do you save a lot of money? And mm -hmm. 
for the future. And those sorts of statistical based research, you know, people have said, well, there's, this shows a correlation without Any, causation. Yeah. And again, you know, how do you disentangle cultural yeah. aspects from linguistic aspects? And yeah. that is really hard yeah. with the statistical stuff. And yeah. so a lot of the statistical stuff has been kind of discounted and, mm -hmm. you know, proven to have some serious methodological flaws. Um, but I think the, the more experimental based, um, research has been a bit more robust. Again, though, the interpretation is the question, how how significant are these effects? Right. And when it comes down to it, how much do they matter outside of the lab in terms yes. of the many yeah. other things, things that constrain yeah. our thinking? Yeah. If you, you can isolate, you know, in very carefully mm -hmm. controlled experiments, this, a small this kind of behavior, effect. but in the, in the, re in real life, what is the importance of that? And mm -hmm. that these are questions that are that are going to take, I think, years to mm -hmm. to sort out. There's a lot more work to be done here. Yeah, well, like we like the question we started with. There are so many factors in how a person thinks about the world. Yes, <laughs> trying to isolate any of them, you know, it's going to be really tough. Human behavior is complex. Yeah, extremely complex. Yeah. So any study that works on it yeah. is always going to be finding only a part of the answer. Yeah. yeah. The one of the nice explanations that I've seen uh, about the the Warfian effect is that maybe it's it's basically like practice, mm -hmm. right? Language makes you practice a certain way of thinking, and you and, do it over and over and, and over again, habitual. and then it becomes habitual. Mm -hmm. And it may be nothing more spooky than that. It mm -hmm. may just be that you just learn to do it because you've practiced it a lot, doesn't mean you can't do it another way, obviously. Um, or that if somebody says, suggests to you, you know, that's a bad habit, don't mm -hmm. do that bad habit yeah, anymore. Yeah. You can't change so there, it. There can be other factors that could counter it or whatever, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but that might explain how we're getting these sorts of effects. effects. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing, and, and this is what I think makes some linguists feel grumpy about it, is it does feel intuitively obvious Yes. That what you say would affect, you know, and on a sort of sociocultural level, we use this all the time. We tell our six-year-olds, don't say you hate it. Don't call that stupid. Mm -hmm. Don't use that word. And as if by saying, don't use that word, you won't have that thought. Thought, yeah. And, you know, obviously telling someone never to call anyone stupid does not mean they never think anyone's stupid. However, allowing somebody to say that everything they don't like is stupid reinforces the behavior. Re or it reinforces the behavior, and it also allows them to draw a conclusion that things they don't like are stupid, mm -hmm. and that that means that anything they don't like is, you know, has this moral quality to mm -hmm. it, which mm -hmm. or to an intellectual quality. So you know, it, it, it and linguists on the one hand want to say the way you say things doesn't constrain your thought, and then on the other one hand, they're always saying. Words have power. Words have meaning. Yeah, you can't just use one word instead of another and pretend. Oh, it doesn't matter whether I say racist terms or non-racist terms. I mean, they're just words. Mm -hmm. And no linguist worth their salt would ever say, "Oh, it doesn't matter what words you use." Um, you know, there's absolutely no difference in register or social meaning between saying intellectually disabled and moronic. Those are totally the same, and of course, it doesn't matter which one you use. No, no linguist would make that argument. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, they're saying, no, the words you use don't affect the way you think. And then on the other hand, they're saying, oh, every single word you use has complete power in terms of the way you shape your world and the way other people react to you. I realize those are not completely equivalent, but I mean, I think this is why it's so tempting to look for these ideas that of linguistic determinism, which I, mm -hmm. I know is the discredited version. Because we do spend an awful lot of time controlling or attempting to control what words people use to refer to certain things because we feel it affects their actions and their thought patterns. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single parent has done that. And we do it all the way through childhood. Governments try to do it, and we think it's wrong that they do if they try to censor things. And that's what people don't like. You know, liberal thought police and PC culture and all of these things. The fact that we argue about it suggests that we think it really matters, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's that that makes people feel like, yeah, there must be some truth to the idea that if we use certain words, it affects the way we think. And, you know, I'm, I'm a lay person. I'm not a linguist. And I, I'm still, I've listened to lots and lots of people debunking. I mean, you are probably the person I know who is <laughs> most favorable to this theory. Yeah. 
to link with the idea of linguistic relativism, let's say. Uh, most of the other linguistic podcasts I listen to and other linguists are firmly against it, right? Like mm-hmm. John McWhorter has published a whole book debunking it. Yeah. And Daniel Midgley on Talk the Talk is, yeah, he has moments of sort of nodding slightly at some of those experimental work, yeah. but basically thinks it's all unimportant. And yet at the same time, I don't really fully understand the distinction between that and how much time all of those same people spend saying it's really important what word you use or what pronouns you use to refer to people or things. Yeah. You know, those absolutely shape society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Now, to be fair, the other thing that makes a lot of linguists grumpy is the rather sloppy, popular reporting oh, yeah. about linguistic relativity. And that's fair because popular reporting, reporting is, is always, is always sloppy. horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it is a very subtle mm-hmm. and complex area, mm-hmm. which has which I just a long way to so, go yeah. to to before you know we really get a, a an idea of what the parameters are here mm-hmm. and how far the effects go right and so it is you know ripe for misunderstanding mm-hmm. and overextending and overgeneralizing and overgeneralizing yeah. and so yeah. forth yeah and so of course that's at the heart i think of a many linguists reaction to this movie yes because this movie it's kind of interesting it it brings up the superior war hypothesis explicitly yeah. and discusses it does she actually say it's discredited she doesn't express a very clear reaction clear to it. Ex, you know i saw she's just sort of that. defines she it she says oh yes this is a theory in linguistics yeah mm-hmm. but she doesn't sort of say this is true or this is not true mm-hmm. But then, to a certain extent, that's part of her character. She's not a character of definitive statements. Right. How many definitive statements did she make in that movie? Like four, Mm -hmm. you know, at moments Mm -hmm. of crisis, and that was about Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Everything else was sort of... It's more complicated than that. Or or (laughs) also just sort of a reactive, or like she said very little. Right. I will say one of the things that really struck me about that movie, it's a movie about language and communication. There's so much silence in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So much silence. So much, and specifically silence of in terms of verbal communication. Mm-hmm. Like there's so there's so little dialogue actually, mm-hmm. which right. is interesting for a, a movie about language. Like she doesn't talk that much. Even we get an awful lot of shots of her looking worried, or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. her her child in her memory talks more than she does in a lot of scenes. Yeah. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting. But yeah, they mo- they bring up this idea, and then they kind of seem to tacitly say that's Except what's happening. That's what's happening. Now, and the question that I had about that is: let's assume that you know there is validity to the Sa- Superior Wharf hypothesis mm-hmm. to the degree that it could actually really change the yeah. way you think if you cha- learned a new language. Yeah. Would her basic knowledge of the language be enough? I mean, she's been working on it for a fairly short amount of time, Mm -hmm. you know, from... Ah, but, okay, so this is where the time travel paradox stuff comes in. Yes. Okay. So we're assuming that at some point in her future, she understands the language better? So when she's looking at, so at that last scene, right before the explosion, and Mm -hmm. if you haven't seen the movie, this isn't going to make any sense, but it's too complicated to explain. But basically, right before the sort of crisis explosion moment, Mm -hmm. the aliens give that huge... Complex, complex uh, image blast set of, of lots and blast of tons and tons, tons and tons of words, words or, or phrases sentences. or sentences yeah. or whatever they are. The rings, yeah. each of so each circle is a sentence or a concept or a thought, yeah. basically. And it's like I don't know, thousands of them, right? Mm-hmm. Thousands and thousands and thousands of them, and they capture this image. And they're like, well, if only we could understand this, but it's going to take us years to to yeah. comprehend this. And she's looking at it right as they're evacuating. Mm-hmm. She has one of those memory flashbacks. And the memory flashback she has is to have her opening the book that she has just, the, the proofs or the books have just arrived, the box right. of books, of her the book of her work on the definitive language. work of the universal language, right. which is clearly a book in which she is, you know, ex- essentially translating or explaining or mm-hmm. teaching okay. this language. So my understanding of that moment was that until that moment, she did not understand mm-hmm. the language fully beyond these, you know, pieces she'd worked out. Mm-hmm. But then she has a momentary glimpse of what we realize is the future, Mm -hmm. where she will have worked this all out piece by piece. And then having had that glimpse, she now has that same So because she becomes fluent in the language in the future, future, 
She now suddenly is fluent in it now. Yeah. Now that's okay. a paradox, obviously, because yeah. now that she's now fluent in it, she doesn't yeah. need to work it out. But that's and a temporal will... paradox that temporal science paradoxes... fiction deals with all the time. Yeah. So. And that, that... Okay. But that was right, my that, understanding. That rescues that. That, that yeah. explanation rescues that. Because that's why she can... S- and she just has a sudden... Because it's all in a sort of sudden revelatory moment. And she suddenly says, mm-hmm. I know what this is. Mm-hmm. This is the whole language. Maybe she doesn't even fully understand it in that moment. But she understands a mm-hmm. lot of it. And she realizes this is the whole language and I can read it. And it's after, now she's been having these glimpses of her future, but it's after that, that she fully kind of mm-hmm. starts to do this thing where she is living mm-hmm. in all of these times at the same time and and is got now. So, you know, using the movie's premise, it seems that as soon as she starts to learn any of the alien's language, mm-hmm. she starts to have the... F- flash forwards of mm-hmm. memory she starts to become unloosed in time you know unmoored in time right she starts to become but she doesn't get fully into that until she fully understands the language right okay. now i think that sort of rescues it but it doesn't come i mean it becomes it's it's all a bit magical thinking even on the superior wharf hypothesis yes the idea that learning five words in another language would start you having such a radically different conception of the world that you had like a new power right <laughs> that's a bit x many mm-hmm. you know and i mean that's a bit it is well there's and the a other lot thing of is, magic in that movie you know it, it's a second language but she still has her first language mm-hmm. right so she hasn't given up that original way no. of thinking yeah this is where the you know the research is still you know, kind of fuzzy and in mm-hmm. progress. But I mean, to what extent is your second language learning, if there are superior war effects? any kind of effect. To what extent does it carry over to when you're thinking in your first language? Mm-hmm. Or and or another way of putting it, when Worf was doing that research that probably mm-hmm. wasn't very good research, yeah. he was looking at what is the effect of your first language on the way you think. Right. Does learning a little bit of another language really, could it open up there's some Such. evidence with with bilinguals that mm-hmm. the the language you're currently working in can yeah, but that's bilingual. Bilingual, so it depends. You know what how, what degree of bilingual? Yeah, second language and bilingualism are not really. The, I mean, some people who are bilingual is a second language. Yeah, but you know, a lot of bilingual people are people who grew up normally. To me, bilingual means that you, two languages from the beginning. From the beginning, or both from to a native on, proficiency, native anyway, proficiency. Yeah. and that's pretty high level. Mm-hmm. She's not native proficiency in that language. No. At least until maybe that moment of revelation yeah. at the end. So she's, you know, very much a adult second language learner. <laughs> right. And yet suddenly it's but of course, you know, that's questioning the basic premise of the movie that you could even have this kind of that learning to think of time in a way that wasn't linear would suddenly allow you to know the future. Right. I mean, those are not actually the same thing. <laughs> but it's suggesting that it really is. Mm-hmm. That if you truly, truly didn't think of time as linear, mm-hmm. it wouldn't be. And that's where the magic kind of comes yeah. into. But there's lots of magic in the movie. I mean, the way those spaceships move, the mm-hmm. way that yeah. everything well, I mean, happens, the there's thing. lots of magic. Yeah. So yeah. if you accept, you know, the the, the various science fiction aspects and All the of it, technological then, yeah. you know, things that we, are not explained. Now, on a, a sort of more thematic level, mm-hmm. one of the things that I thought was clever, given that they were working with this idea of linguistic determinism, mm-hmm. is that it mirrored nicely onto the idea of sort of a deterministic universe. Right. If you know the future, can do you, you change can it? Can you change it? And and that seems to be the question, and I'm quite in, interested in reading the short story now, but mm-hmm. the question that the story posits more, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the story of your life. The story right. of your life, right? To what degree would you Mm-hmm. act in, you know, whatever way if you knew the future. Yeah, so that's the emotional plot line. Yeah. The one that I was talking about, about the death of her child. So the twist, please stop listening if you don't want to know the twist. <laughs> I'm about to say it. The twist is that what we think all the way through are her memories of a child who has died turn out to be her future. Yeah. And they are not, in fact, her memories. That's The movie itself tells the story out of narrative normal narrative structure Mm -hmm. it starts with something you know as it's giving us what we thought were flashbacks but they're flash forwards right and in the end she chooses to have a baby to marry and to have a baby knowing that the child will grow up with an incurable disease and die before reaching adulthood and she oh no she asks she asks the man who's going to become her husband yeah if you knew the future would you change your life yeah. He doesn't really answer it fully because he doesn't really understand yeah. the question. 
And it turns out that she does tell him at some point that she knew and made this decision anyway, and that's why he leaves mm-hmm. her, because he can't handle... He thinks it's the wrong choice. Well, and he's just so emotionally devastated yeah. by yeah. by the result, too, and by the inevitable death of her. You know, she then... Bur- I've, I've got to say, she burdens him with the knowledge, yeah. too. I mean, on the one hand, it's a lot to bear yourself, but having made that choice to then tell him once he can't make the choice mm-hmm. that, hey, your seven-year-old daughter is going to grow up and die before she's 20. Mm-hmm. Hey, live the next... You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. anyway, <laughs> mustn't think too much about it because this is the part that was wrecking me when I was watching the movie. But yeah, so the question is like, could she have decided, seeing all that future, yeah. not to do it, not to marry him, mm-hmm. not to mm-hmm. make a baby, whatever. And some of that's about determinism and some of it's about the sort of temporal paradox. Yeah. If she'd done that, what yeah. would happen? Yeah. Well, and it, it raises the question mm-hmm. of free will. I mm-hmm. mean, you know. To what degree does one have free will if you see time in this nonlinear way? Uh, And that's the the philosophical question that any discussion about free will versus predetermination Mm -hmm. throughout human history has uh, has raised. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for instance, you know, when Boethius tackles this question and comes to the the question of what about God's knowledge, Mm -hmm. right? It's not that God knows that bad things are going to happen and lets them happen anyways. For God, it all happens at once, right? Mm -hmm. God doesn't see time in a linear fashion. So yeah, there's no causality in a sense. There's no causality. So this rescues the- Why does God let bad things happen? Why does God let bad things happen? Well, he doesn't. It all happens happens. at once. It all happens at once for God. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the sort of philosophical way out of, of that problem. Yeah. And yet this movie sort of walks an odd line with that because on the one hand, these aliens apparently see all time happening at once. Yeah. And yet they clearly have a very strong sense of causality because they're saying, we're giving you this gift because we will need it in 3000 years. We will need your help. But still there's a causality to that. There's yeah. like, we, they needed, you know, they took a very big action. Coming to earth is not yeah, presumably yeah. a nothing action. They took a major action in order to cause an action to happen later. Yeah, and that's and and Earth could have not done it, mm-hmm. right? Earth could have failed to understand or not Presumably made that they choice. Knew that Earth wouldn't fail to understand. Maybe, <laughs> but do but do you know? Do they like you know that that the question isn't really answered and and. The well, causality I mean, becomes because they are. Do we live in a in a deterministic, deterministic universe, universe or not? They seem to act. The aliens mm-hmm. seem to act as if they have choices, and if other people have choices, mm-hmm. if it is deterministic, and you know that, then there's no action is necessary. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. And the other thing I don't fully understand about the movie's own premise is she then going to teach all of the world this language, and are they all going to have the same? Because she seems to be the only one who. Yeah. Has this, has this ability. power. Mm-hmm. Her husband didn't, even though he too learned that language, right? He was learning to it a with her. To degree, anyways, yeah. Mm-hmm. He was learning what some of those words were. He was able mm-hmm. to translate, I mean, not as much as her, but he was learning some of it. And he never, he said he was having dreams, but he didn't seem to have mm-hmm. anywhere near the same experience she was. So I, I think the thing about the movie that was, I mean, it was a good movie and it was an interesting thought experiment. And as you say, it raises more than just linguistic questions. It raises, obviously, big philosophical questions and questions about time and questions about causality and all those things. The question from a linguistic point of view is, does it perpetuate an outmoded theory? Does it raise an interesting question or does it just play with linguistics for the same reason movies mostly play with any kind of expert thing to give them a springboard into something that doesn't really have anything to do with the original topic? I think in part it's the last, but mm-hmm. it plays with it in a fairly knowledgeable way. Right. I mean, I think they, the movie makers have grasped the concept of what... The original theory was, certainly. The, yeah. Do they understand any of the later... <laughs> later nuances to mm-hmm. it? Probably not. But it is interesting that this is a theory that is now kind of in the hot seat Mm -hmm. again, and that there is a lot of work being done on this area, Mm -hmm. and it is a topic that is much debated now again. Mm -hmm. So they're at least latching on to a current Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. argument. 
Right. And all the stuff about translation was interesting. I mean, yeah. one of the things that went around that I know the people were reacting against was, uh, was it Neil deGrasse Tyson who said, oh, you know, I don't understand why they didn't send a code breaker, not a <laughs> linguist. I mean, if you're trying to talk to an alien. Yeah. <laughs> because he seems to think linguists, I don't know, are just literary translators. No, no offense to literary translators. That's no, there's no just in front of that. That's an incredibly mm-hmm. difficult job. But that that's he doesn't understand the fact that, that what a linguist is is yeah, it's to some extent a code breaker, and also language is not a code. Yeah, language is not a mathematical code. Mm-hmm. Language is not a statistical problem you have to solve. Yeah, it has a lot of complicated elements, uh, to, elements it. to it. You need to know what I, language is. Yeah. It is not the same as being given like um, an algorithm and asked to figure mm-hmm. out what's the password for this. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he realized that this is something that actual linguists do. All the time. All the time. Uh, well, not all the time because the there's not but, that many languages yeah. left to do this too. But to mm-hmm. start from you know, square one mm-hmm. in uh, learning a language from nothing. Mm-hmm. Without a translator, without, without an intermediary. Yeah. Yeah. That's that problem of um, it's easy to pick on Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's not really fair because the man does some really, really good stuff. But he does have a bit of that expert problem of thinking because he's an expert in one thing, he's an expert in everything. <laughs> you know, like that his expertise must therefore make, you know, in that one field makes him smarter about things. <laughs> Or well, that the, the universe can all be explained reduced down to, to his uh, expertise, to physics, right? <laughs> yeah, to his expertise, because you know he he keeps weighing in on these yes. things and assuming that science, his brand of science, is always the right answer, You're right? And th- th- that's played with. I bring that up because that's played with in the movie to some extent yes. too, right? Yeah. Right in the beginning, when the linguist meets the physicist, they are both sort of assuming that their approach is the thing that will unlock it. Yeah. And then the military guy, when they start kind of butting heads slightly, the military guy says, yeah, that's why you're both here. Yeah. <laughs> because we don't know which approach is going to be wor- is going to work, so we want both of them. Which premise is not carried through at all in the rest of the movie, but mm-hmm. it was kind of funny. Because mm-hmm. it is a, that idea that a specialist will always look at a problem through the lens of their specialty. Sure. And that kind of brings us back to one of the things we're interested in here in this podcast we know that we're only specialists in a few things, if if even a few things, but we know that it blinds you if you always look at the world through your specialty. Yeah. That that's a problem, that's a limitation, that's a it's a strength, but it's a limitation too. And that's the whole point of the connections. Yeah. It's the theme of trying to always think about, well, what am I missing by always looking through my own specialty? Is that a round enough circle for us <laughs> to have come back to? Sure. <laughs> Since... This, the lesson of arrival is to not be linear. <laughs> but do let us know if you want to hear more from us about linguistic relativity, because mm-hmm. I'm always happy to talk more about it. It's a, a subject that I have researched on a bit. And conceptualization of time. And conceptualization of time. Someday we'll do a whole, well, a whole episode, episode on, on time. time. Yeah. yeah. And I can talk about my, my favorite topic, uh, spatiotemporal metaphors. Mm-hmm. And time travel stories and, and things like that. And time travel stories yeah. and, and so forth. So yeah. if you want to hear more of that sort of thing, let us know. Mm-hmm. But I think while we did have a couple of thoughts about other topics we would talk about tonight, I think, in fact, we've ended up filling our time quite nicely just by discussing the movie and ideas that sprang from it. So I think we can end it there. Indeed. And thank you for listening, if you have been, to the last two seasons. (laughs) And here's to another season of potentially ridiculous cocktails, interesting guests, and not boring ourselves by talking about things we love (laughs) (laughs) and finding the connections. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.